Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the second one in a series about getting started with existential psychology. In the last video in this series, we looked at two basic things. First, we looked at how existentialists tend to conceive of existence. And second, we looked at the interrelationship between existential thinking and a movement in thought that's very much related to it, phenomenology. And basically, we noticed that, well, you know, the intersection between those two prefigures three interrelated regions or types of inquiry into the nature of being or existence. Pure phenomenological inquiry, existential phenomenological inquiry, and literary existential inquiry. But beyond that, we made note of the fact that existentialists think about existence uh, in ways that are much more process-oriented, much more dynamism-oriented than our average way of thinking about existence or reality is. And also, uh, we made note of the fact that existentialists think about existence in a much more holistic way than average, too, such that the objective side of reality and the subjective side of reality are always interlinked and unfolding in an ongoing dynamism with respect to one another. Another way of putting that same idea is that what we are and what the world is are always mutually and reciprocally influencing one another. So that's all stuff from last time to sort of help you remember. Uh, here comes the new stuff for this time. Now remember the overarching project of what we were doing in this particular series of videos. I'm basically unpacking what I think is a common everyday rendering of how people think about existentialism. And in the beginning of your notes, I, I rendered it this way. A somewhat gloomy, atheistic, and individualistic philosophy of existence. So the last video was about is existentialism about existence, and of course, uh, the answer was yes and no, it is about existence, but it's existence thought in kind of a specialized way, namely in terms of an ongoing dynamism and more specifically yet in terms of a holistic idea. Okay, so I guess that's all from last time. Thought I was done with that, evidently not. So. Um, Let's uh, continue unpacking that statement. So I characterized existentialism as a philosophy of existence. So the question for today is, is existentialism a philosophy? Once again, the answer is yes and no. Like I told you in the last video, all these questions are gonna have yes and no answers. So in what ways is existentialism a, a kind of philosophy? Well, uh, the first and most obvious thing is that classes in existentialism are almost always taught within philosophy departments within universities. And, you know, that's emblematic of how people commonly conceive of existentialism as a mode of philosophy. Um, the second thing has to do with uh, what I said in the last video about existential phenomenology, which is um, that when you read a book in existential phenomenology, it sure does feel like philosophy. It's full of references to other philosophers like Kant and Hegel and uh, the philosophers of antiquity like, you know, Heraclitus and uh, Plato and people like that. So uh, that definitely makes it feel like a mode of philosophy between the two of those. So it's taught in universities and philosophy departments and certainly there's a sector of existential thinking that very much feels like philosophy. But how is existentialism not a philosophy then? Because the answer was yes and no. Okay, so uh, the first answer to that probably has to do with what we talked about in the last video with respect to literary existentialism, which I said uh, very often feels not like a mode of philosophy, but almost like a mode of uh, narration or storytelling or something like that. The fact is that these existential thinkers fairly often will express their ideas not merely in a traditional philosophical form, but in some kind of artistic or quasi-artistic form. Like some of them will write uh, poetry, like Heidegger wrote poetry. You may know that Jean-Paul Sartre wrote uh, plays and novels and things like that, like um, No Exit, I guess, would be one of the more famous plays, and uh, Nausea, or Nausea in English. Uh, is one of the more famous novels. Um, Nietzsche wrote music, <laughs> you know, so he wrote music. You can look it up on YouTube. You go like, like type in Nietzsche music, you know, and you can hear some of uh, Nietzsche's compositions. Um, so the point is that that's not typical of mainstream philosophy for 
philosophers to express their ideas in these uh, relatively florid artistic forms in addition to traditional philosophical discourse. So that already make, might make you wonder whether uh, existentialism is a mode of philosophy, at least in sort of the conventional and vanilla sense of the word, but there's a deeper reason why you might question that, okay? A much deeper reason, and it has to do with uh, the basic movement of existential discourse and insights, okay? So uh, first let's, uh, let's um, characterize traditional historical philosophical discourse in a real general way. I would say that um, for the most part, in a very general way, philosophy typically operates like this, like it articulates uh, some set of axiomatic premises, tries to convince you of the correctness of that, articulates some kind of method, applies the method to the premises, and derives necessary conclusions. In other words, it's the entire enterprise, for the most part, is oriented around trying to convince you of necessary conclusions in a more or less rational type of way, okay? So it's about convincing you. It's about arguing you into having to accept a bunch of ideas as true in some sense, okay? So existentialism is not going to do that. Homie, don't play that, okay? So existentialism hardly ever does that. <laughs> Maybe 1% of the time, but hardly ever. Instead, it operates according to a very uh, different method. And uh, the method has much more to do with uh, evocation. Okay, so evoking a certain sensibility. Often, uh, instead of operating in a purely linear, rational, deductive type way, uh, existentialism will employ what's sometimes known as indirect communication. Okay, so this is kind of an idea from Kierkegaard, one of the early, actually the progenitor of the whole movement, whom we'll be talking about, what, in maybe six videos from now or something like that, or a few videos. At any rate, indirect communication. So uh, uses of uh, sarcasm, parables, aphorisms, pithy epigrams, like evocative and provocative statements. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, this is... Um, uh, what it is, what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to evoke a certain kind of experience in you, the reader. They're trying to evoke a certain kind of sensibility with respect to the riddle of existence, in essence. So they're not trying to convince you of anything in an odd kind of way. They're not trying even to inform you in a certain way. What they're trying to do is draw you into the experience of awakening to the reality of being. Okay, so they're trying to draw you toward, invite you toward, exhort you toward, having a certain kind of experience of realizing the reality of your life, realizing the reality of existence. In other words, they're not really trying to inform you, they're trying to change you. Okay, and this, this is part of what makes existentialism somewhat different from mainstream traditional philosophy. Okay, so it's not really op tr operating in this, like, let's play the game of rationality in order to convince you of necessary truths given some set of axiomatic suppositions and some kind of method. It's not going to be doing that. It's going to be operating at a very different level. Okay, the level of evocation to evoke, to draw you into experiencing a certain kind of something. And the something is a certain uh, appreciation and uh, perhaps sense of wonderment and also terror and horror at the reality of human existence. Okay, so why do they do that? Why do existentialists do that? Well, one reason is that the existentialists have realized that rational type argumentation hardly ever really changes anyone in any deep or substantive type way. Usually the most that it does is sort of plays on the outer periphery of our cognitive capacities and it's like, oh, now I'm going to regard, uh, you know, Proposition X as being uh, correct instead of Proposition Y. You know, that's not what changes us in the pith and marrow 
of where we live and breathe, okay? That hardly ever is that the case. Maybe one time in a thousand it might be the case, but hardly ever. Like, what really changes us, what really moves us, what really deepens our lives occurs according to a very different kind of logic. It's a little bit like Blaise Pascal said in Pensy's, like the heart has its own reasons that reason knows not of. Although Pascal was not, I guess, a card-carrying existentialist, he was certainly an antecedent to existential thought that was very sympathetic with existential thought. If you ever read Pensy's, there are many ideas like that. That's one of the more famous ones from that book. Um, Pascal, gotta love Pascal. Um, so, uh, mathematician, the old programming language named after him. Uh, this was uh, th this was during the Enlightenment period where you were in l you were allowed to be uh, more than a one-trick pony in your life. Like you could be good at a bunch of different things. So the heart has its own reasons that reason knows not of. So one way of thinking about existentialism is that it's trying to operate more according to the logic of the heart than the logic of reason narrowly defined. Okay, because the logic of the heart is what we live according to. The logic of the heart is how we change our lives. It's how we change our relation to life and our relation to existence as a whole. So the existentialists have figured that out and they're trying to operate according to that, according to that. Okay, so uh, in your notes, let's see how I said it in your notes. Uh, ultimately, existentialism seeks to foster a certain passionate sensibility with respect to the riddle of existence. Existentialism and existentialists, excuse me, have noticed that even the most clever and convincing argumentation rarely changes anyone or anything in any genuinely profound way. In essence, existentialism doesn't try to convince you of anything or even inform you of anything. It only tries to awaken you to the reality you're already inhabiting and to occasion a more profound kind of participation in it. It's an awakening project. It's not a information type project, you get? And it's not trying to ramrod some set of rational conclusions down your throat either. It's not trying to convince you. It's trying to awaken you. I feel like I have to say this a bunch of times because it's, it's running against the grain of some of our prevailing socially sanctioned logic, you know, where we think the only things that have value are the ones that are sort of rationally coherent and defensible. It's like, yeah, being rationally and coherent and defensible is a wonderful thing. But there's more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in that philosophy. That's not Pascal. That's Shakespeare. Hamlet. <laughs> Look it up. Read it. It's a cool book. It's hella bitchin' type book. <laughs> Shakespeare. I was in love with Shakespeare when I was a kid. Um, I even went to the Folger Shakespeare uh, Library down in Washington, D.C. and uh, looked at the ancient folios and all of that. I was very sort of <laughs> possessed, I guess, <laughs> for a, whatever 15-year-old kid to be into Shakespeare that much. But anyhow, all right, you're learning way too much about me in this class. Okay, so let's, let's get on with <laughs> sort of the material. Uh, it's okay to learn. You know, if you're a holist, okay, if you're a holist, sidebar moment, then um, the ideas you have are integral to the person you are and the history that you've been through. So, you know, maybe it's not completely irrelevant to tell you things of a more personal nature. Like, if you really see things in this holistic way, well, you know, <laughs> every truth you articulate comes out of the history you've been through. We like to pretend that's not true a lot of the time, but it actually is. Okay, so end of sidebar little moment. All right, so consequently existentialism may be more of a sensibility or an attitude than a philosophy, at least in the formal or usual sense. Okay, more of a sensibility, you know, a way of relating to life. You know, it may be more of that. Okay, so... Um, one of the implications of this is, by the way, you can, like, if you're a young student, let's say you're 20 years old or thereabouts, you could take this idea and freaking run with it, all right, and apply it to all of your classes. Like, maybe all of your classes aren't so much about informing you as ultimately about trying to awaken you to the reality of life, okay, that that's really the deep meaning. And the pragmatic reasons that we normally give you for being well-educated are the least of it, 
You getting it? They're the least important ones. So the pragmatic reasons we give you are things like, well, you want to be, uh, you know, get a good job with good pay and have a professional career. You want to be well educated. You want to be the life of the damn next cocktail party, and so on and so forth. And engaging, engaging in all kinds of uh, witty and highly trenchant badinage, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, that's the least important thing. The more important thing is that you awaken to life. Okay. Just be straightforward. All your classes. Okay, thought experiment. What if it were the case that all of your classes today were ultimately about trying to awaken you to the reality of life? Underneath all the damn reasons and fancy vocabulary and blah, 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 it was all about trying to awaken you to a more profound appreciation and a more profound participation in the reality you're already inhabiting, being alive as a human being in the early 21st century. Okay? So they're all trying to awaken you, I think, underneath it all. It's just that existentialism makes it much more obvious and explicit. Okay, so, uh, all right, didn't know I was going to go on that tear, but, you know, it's okay to be spontaneous every now and then. I think the universe is broad enough and deep enough to contain that. I could be wrong. All right, so existentialism is trying to awaken this kind of sensibility, this kind of different relation to life, more profound relation to life. Um... I'm laughing because it seems so heretical, I guess, to say this in an academic context, you know, where we worship at the temple of kind of a crude pragmatism so often. So uh, if you were to run with this idea, then, you know, your education isn't merely about learning instrumental forms of reason, right? Like means ends type of reason that the deeper latency of thinking itself might have to do with awakening. Okay, the thing you're learning mainly in college, all right? To think better, to know better, to know more stuff, to be more agile in your cognitive processes and more accurate and quicker and all that stuff that they measure on IQ tests, all right? <laughs> you know, that, that really what it's about is, uh, you know, coming into something like ecstatic reason, you know, where reason itself becomes a form of ecstasy. And here it's like, oh my God, you're taking it too far in this video. It's only the second one in the series and you're already taking it too far. Ecstatic. Oh, let's notice, uh, since we talked a little bit about the etymology of the word existence in the last video, actually, the etymology of the word ecstasy is the same. <laughs> so you may think, well, this was just an arbitrary and capricious choice of vocabulary. Not really, because... Uh, ecstatic reason is the reason of standing out in the world. The, we, the, the kind of reason that's about awakening you to reality. And I'm using the phrase ecstatic reason because it's from your Rollo May reading, page 85. Okay, A phrase that Heidegger uses, more or less the counterpart to that, would be meditative thinking. Oh, what an interesting thing, meditative thinking. In other words, like... The, the thing we've been really trying to teach you at the meta level, which is how to think, uh, the vision we've given you is actually um, probably the most superficial vision, all right? You know? <laughs> so so really we're, what we're trying to do right now is deepen your sense for what thinking even is, okay? So what if, what if thinking and learning and uh, all the stuff you have to do is really about helping you awaken to reality, all right? It's like a red pill thing like from the matrix or something like that you know like that kind of thing all right so why is this important because uh you know maybe you've detected this in your classes somewhere along the way that there's a common sort of affliction i think is the word i would pick um in the academic world that goes something like this a lot of what you learn doesn't seem very re relevant to your life have you noticed this like somewhere along the way you know <laughs> notice this sort of in elementary school but i was sort of a I guess, annoyingly precocious and rebellious kid. Um, but I noticed that, like, uh, I was hardly ever learning things that really seemed to matter all that much, whether I knew them or not. A lot of the stuff you learn in school, you could just as easily look up, you know. And this is back in the day. I'm a boomer generation. You could look it up in a book. Well, nowadays, it's way easier. You can just look it up on the Internet, okay? All right. So, uh kind of a strange thing, you know, like when you think about it, because you're spending a fair fraction of your life doing this stuff, right? Let's say you're a junior now. That means you've spent approximately the last 15 years of your life, a freaking decade and a half, which is actually an appreciable fraction of your life when you think about it. Let's say you live to, uh, what, 90. Okay, that's pretty old. That's older than average. So, what, 
15 into 90 goes uh, two, four, six times, all right? So that's one sixth of your life you've spent so far doing this. Might be good to ask what's really going on at some point, just a thought. All right, so existentialism wants to ask these kinds of annoying uh, questions. Uh, but the upshot of this, and I hope you're getting this idea, is that uh, existentialism has a kind of reputation for being sort of anti-rational, right? Like it's not just going to play a straight vanilla rational game. But the deeper, the deeper meaning is that it's not really anti-rational, you see? What it is is extra-rational. In other words, what it's trying to do is honor the rational project and insights that derive from the project of rationality, but to expand the outer periphery of what we think thinking is so that it's way wider, so that it embraces things like artistic type insights, evocative type insights, the process of um, awakening, spiritual spirituality, so that it embraces like a way wider horizon of different meanings and different efficacies than, than reason, the way we normally think about it, typically does. So I would argue that it's not really ra anti-rational. It's like, well, it's just anti-rational. You're learning a form of anti-rationalism. Well, come on. You know, it's about being extra rational. <laughs> okay, so widening the outer periphery. So uh, here's how I said it in your notes. Existentialism aims at a kind of thinking that is also a kind of feeling. It's important to feel what you claim to think every now and then. And I would say that it's important for you young people to become passionate thinkers, right? Thinkers for whom, uh, you know, the workings of your mind and the workings of your heart are interlinked, interwoven, woven together, right? And normally that's not a normal thought, but I think it's an important one. That is also a kind of feeling that is also a kind of breathing, like how your body moves, how you inhabit your body. Why should your thinking and your knowledge and all of that kind of stuff be divorced from your, your corporeal existence? Well, that just seems kind of arbitrary and capricious when you think about it. You know, like maybe you should sweat what you claim to know sometimes. That would be a good thing. You know, like I, I think we professors should sweat more often. You know, like I think one of the signs of a good lecture as far as I'm concerned, I go out of the lecture, I smell like a damn donkey. And it's like, yeah, man, that smells like a good lecture to me. <coughs> yeah, that's the smell of victory right there. So uh, it's also a kind of breathing, also a kind of way of relating to others, relating to the world, re relating to the human race, relating to all sentient beings, to animals, to anything that perceives at all. In short, holistic thinking. All right, so that's really what we're getting at. What is it to think holistically? Where like all of the dimensions of who and what you are are engaged and you're waking up to reality along the way. Because that's the kind of uh, thinking that existentialism is aiming at, and that makes it different from traditional philosophy, which, which by and large seeks to dwell in the upper ethereal regions of reason narrowly conceived. Okay, that's probably enough for this video. I thought I was going to do more, but I, I kind of got excited. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. All right, it's okay to be passionate. All right, so I'll try to sort of weasel out of it that way. All right, it's okay for you to be passionate. All right, but at any rate, let's end this video here. Um, okay, uh, keep hanging on. Keep hanging on to the bar. All right, you're going to get the hang of this if you just keep keep at it. All right, so have a have a great day. It looks like a wonderful sunny day in the um, Monday morning here in Georgia. I'm looking out the window right now, and you know, it looks like I might go some sunbathing a little bit later. All right, take care, and I'll see you in video number three. <laughs> All right, have a good one.